All right, we will carry on where we left off. So we're, ha we're part way through objective two. Um, so yeah, over to you, Andrew. Um, yes, thank you very much. So if my understanding is we may have covered what needs to be covered with respect to passenger rail, um, if that's correct. Um, uh, yes, that's correct. Cool. Um, Mark, if you're happy to just outline what we understand the committee's decisions are with respect to amending the passenger rail section of the plan, um, can can note that and then move on to the next section. Great. So we have a few. Um, we've got the addition of intra uh, regional um, to passenger rail services. Um, we have uh, the inclusion of low emission rolling stock in terms of the investigation of future rolling stock. Um, we have an additional action to support investigation to extend the Auckland passenger rail network into the North Waikato, including Tuakau and Pocono. And we have a clarification that the advocacy um, related, the advocacy for future um, passenger rail is to central government. Um, there was a latter one, which I'll cycle back to under objective five, which is the enabling infrastructure for integration with first and last mile journeys, including um, first and last mile journeys. But I'll, I'll remind you of that when we get back to objective five, just to keep us in order. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Andrew. Cool, okay, so the next um, next sort of topic area under objective two is regional services. So this is where the draft plan set out an aspiration to connect every urban area within the region with at least a baseline level of service um, and, and including um, connections within urban areas as well. So um, this received really quite strong support um, by way of submissions. Um, there were um, a notion that maybe the minimum aspiration of a daily return service between the areas isn't ambitious enough. Um, and this was uh, yeah, uh, submissions against with a small number of submissions, not necessarily against, but raising concerns with respect to cost and affordability of, of providing services like that on a region wide basis. Um, so in terms of suggested amendments to the plan, um, uh, staff recommend clarifying that the the plan outlines a minimum aspiration of a baseline level of service, a daily daily return. Um, in many cases, we go you know, we'd go above that, and the plan also acknowledges that you know, the needs of communities will be assessed on a case by case basis, um, assuming there's funding and other things. Um, we received a submission um, which was referenced by others from Waikato Tainui, um, pointing out the importance of accessibility for Māori um, on a region-wide basis and referenced a growing trend for Māori moving to Papakaianga, which have been, tend to be um, located rurally and requested some um, acknowledgement of that, which we re recommended we make those changes. Um, there was also a number of submissions questioning the term value for money. So in the draft plan is submitted, um, you know, the, the aspirations were caveated by a notion of demonstrating value for money. Um, so we recommend removing that term because it is subjective, um, but removing the term doesn't negate the need for you know, robust processes to access funding um, as well. But it does um, remove some of the subjective subjectivity associated with that. Um, we, and we, of course, received um, a number of submissions requesting specific improvements to particular locations or connections. Um, these are really useful for our service planning team. Um, the intent of the RPTP is to enable that policy framework for these things to happen, but not necessarily define specifically uh, what will happen, which um, will come via the actions. Um, so the recommendation is to acknowledge acknowledge these and sort of point to the pathway uh, by which we can get into into that detail. Um, at, a, at a high level, that's that's sort of the summary for this section. If the committee's got questions or anything that we've missed, uh, that's a useful thing. Uh, thanks, Andrew. We've got Councillor Teg. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think you summed that up really well. It's, you know, I'm, I'm really thrilled personally to see this section and this emphasis in the plan. Um, and you know, and the 
preference not to not just between but within smaller towns. I think that's that's a really good step forward. Um, I suppose um, I have a query around um, was it P P eleven policy eleven? It's on forty three of the agenda. Um, where it talks about transport solutions within and between urban areas, and then talks about um, solutions may exceed the minimum baseline policy 10. Uh, but that baseline only applies, or only is a baseline between town, uh, between towns, not within towns. So, um, so and maybe that needs some clarity. Um, but also raises the question for me. From my experience um, in the Coromandel with the Thames service within a town, that in fact I think this this may have been reflected in submissions. I'm not sure, but there's actually greater demand for people to move around within a town than there is between regional towns. Um, and so it's uh, I suppose it raises the question as it's, it's hard to define. I I know. But how, you know, could we consider a baseline service within towns? Um, you know, I always think of smaller towns as, as the equivalent of, say, a large suburb, where if you're in that suburb, your main priority probably is to get to the local facilities within that suburb, and it's the same with the town. Can you get to the doctor? Can you get to your school or place of work or whatever? Um, and so I just, um, you know, there's a diagram, um, I think it's on page 63 or somewhere, where this is all summarised and it just sort of le leapt out at me in that, that having a baseline may be more important for a service within a town than connecting towns. So that's just, um, I, I don't know whether I've got the solution to that because it's actually quite hard to define a baseline service within a town, um, unless you sort of did something around like what is in Thames, which is um, Monday to Friday between um, nine and three. I mean, that that's the baseline service there. So I just flagged that. Um, and then um, there's a map uh, on page, page, but there's a, a map of um, a concept map. Oh, here we go. Um, it's on page 46 of the agenda. And if it's a concept and it's not making any commitments, I'd suggesting I'd suggest joining Coromandel and Fitianga and Fongamata and Waihi, uh, because I think they are they're areas where you know there could be um, you know there could be a demand for connectivity. It certainly is now and probably more more so in the future. So. They're the two things I'd raise in this this part of it. Yeah, OK, so in relation to connections between urban areas, I, I think you're right, like um, connections between urban areas, are, although it depends a lot on context, um, are often trips made less frequently, but often those trips are quite critical. So, you know, for example, yeah, sure. whether it's to access healthcare, so the, the minimum aspiration is much easier to define, you're right. In relation to connect connections within urban areas, um, if the committee was of a mind to put a minimum baseline, it probably would be by way of sort of hours of operation, but leaving open what the solution is, so whether it's a community yep. transport initiative or, or something else. I'll just double check the table. There's a table further on in the plan that has a region wide service level guide. If it's not already, yeah, that's in there. the one I was meaning, yeah. Right. Um, I think it's on 63 or somewhere around there off the agenda. Yeah, it's um, 67 of the agenda pack. <clears throat> is that the one you mean? Um, I think so. I'm just struggling to bring it up on the uh, home home computer, but it should be an A3 landscape um, diagrammatic table.
So it, it says in terms of um, sort of hours of operational minimum frequency, it's just left sort of vague, dependent on transport solution. Both of those. Um, but I think I, I'm warming to your idea of sort of without being too specific, sort of minimum hours, like so many hours a day, that that would be a step forward for me. What sort of hours would you be suggesting, Dennis? Six. Um, through you, Chair, um, we know that the uh, we know that there are a couple of services that have proven very successful. Um, the Thames connector, but also Takaroa services have both proven very successful in terms of those types of within town connection services. Um, and uh, I think from my uh, from my memory, and Andrew, your memory may be better than mine in relation to those, and we can quickly have a look at the timetabling of those, but I understand they effectively operate a six day service Six Andrew, can you? Uh, I can. I can have a look at that while we while we continue on to another matter, sure. and then we can cycle back on that perhaps. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. yeah. Sounds Co good. Cor correct, but I, I would also point out that um, this table is aspirational, and uh, the notion is to meet um, to help enable people to access essential essential things. Um, which isn't limited to the days of the week. So if the committee was of a mind to include reference for hours of operation within the regional town, uh, maybe it should adopt uh, the same notion as between regional towns. OK, um, anything further, Dennis? No, that's it, thank you. OK, um, pro probably for me along similar lines on that map on page 46 of the agenda. Um, would be connecting Matamata with Cambridge um, as a possible future connection there, as referenced in a few submissions. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't have any further comments. Does anyone else? No. Okay, that those changes have been captured. Right. Um, can carry on. Yeah, metro services, so services within Hamilton uh, and between Hamilton and neighbouring towns and within the larger towns around Hamilton is in essence what the metro section of the draft plan um, covers. So again, there were there was um, submissions relating to this were were supportive, um, but with a number of submitters requesting amendments or changes. Um, one of the more substantive ones was really clearly referencing in the PT plan the linkages with the Metro Spatial Plan and the significant amount of work that's um, that's occurred, which which um, this section of the plan is absolutely based on. So we certainly recommend making those um, changes to that effect in the in the final version of the plan. Uh, another submission point was pulling out the in the wording in the plan, although not clearly articulated as priority actions. Um, there's a request to to put them in an, a table around priorities for the metro area. This mainly relates to services outside of the Hamilton urban area uh, and priorities for sort of the, the the larger metro towns. So that's a, a recommended change. And, and various typos and uh, consistency of um, terminology, which hopefully we've captured uh, most of those, but recognising the point earlier around formatting and typos um, will absolutely be captured um, before the plan is adopted and finalised. Uh, and again, there was quite a number of submissions requesting very specific service changes um, and, and the general approach or recommended approach to that is acknowledging um, those uh, and in most cases, or if not all cases, they generally align with the aspirations outlined in the plan as well. But we'll come through fire actions as more detailed planning planning occurs. Um, yes, back back to the chair discussion. Okay. Any comments around the table? 
questions, debate, discussion? No, nothing. Uh, yeah, carry on. We're rocking and rolling now. So targeted, um, targeted services. So targeted services include things like dedicated school bus services, um, um, among our total mobility on demand services, things like that, uh, including services for special events. So generally there was really strong support for the policies relating to the various targeted services, um, with one area being um, uh, submission relating to special event policy and the circumstances a policy framework for the extent of support for such events. So I'm conscious this is a point that um, has been flagged as something that wants to be discussed. Um, I think that's the main, you know, generally all other submissions were very supportive of the section of the plan. Um, the, the component relating to special events is probably the key one for discussion for the committee. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we'll lead off with Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I just wondered in, in response uh, to the submitter um, to field days, Peter Nation, um, and how, like, you're not going to change it in response to his submission, but um, is the main principle around that for not wanting to change it uh, cost? And why haven't we put... Um, the fact that we, whether irrelevant or not, whether it's the, an event is free or charged at the gate, and he said, and actually HCC supported that they they would be happy to, when there's a charge that they would be happy to uh, present. I think he said a third or something um, to contribute. Surely the higher principle for us is emissions reduction. So I just want to understand your thinking around why cost. Um, cost at the gate is more important than emissions reduction for a large event. Because I think our policy is 20,000 attendees, right? Awful lot of cars. Yeah, absolutely. So I should, <laughs> I, look, I should declare that I don't have strong views either way on this. It's, um, um, it's a good, a good policy for the committee to, to debate and discuss and, and that they might, um, the, might be of a mind to change it, um, but the sort of the uh, speaking to how the policy was formulated in the in the past, it was a notion of enabling regional council to provide support for special events, but making a distinction where the cost of that support <coughs> lies. So the the basic principle being for commercial events or events that charge uh, an entry fee, the cost of enabling that uh, public transport support for that event um, should be built into the cost of running that commercial event and, and making a distinction between um, large you know large scale non-commercial and community yeah. events so, um, so can we change then um, can we change it we can we can keep I guess we can keep um, free community large scale free community events but when there is a charge can we um, can we then offer, we can't require, can we, but can we offer that we would put on um, PT services to that event for partnership of a third or, we because we've done it before, right? We've done it for the sevens or something, someone said, we've done large scale. Yeah, so there is, for context, there is an ongoing arrangement with H3, uh, and Waikato Rugby for putting on shuttles, and that arrangement predated the um, the existing policy and the operative plan, so it's been yeah you know, grandfathered through. Um, so so it's it's still operating. So yeah, Peter Nation's correct to reference that, um, but the context is it predated the the, the policy yep. and the plan. The um, I think and probably would defer to Mark on that. Uh, your question about you know the policy could be changed it just becomes a question of where does the money come from um, yeah through you chair um that's uh yeah there's two there's two things um one is the exactly that the question of where the funding would come from um for that and two 
Um, even if a funding envelope is set, um, much like um, if, if a particular, if a specific funding envelope is set for special events, um, the question then becomes how do we avoid simply a first come, first serve, um, a first come, first serve if that were to be, um, I mean, first come, first serve is a perfectly valid approach to take to the allocation of funding, but sometimes doesn't necessarily mean that the best case best case wins. So I think there is a little bit of complexity that comes alongside uh, in bearing away from an approach where quite simply if it's, if it's a large event that has uh, that's free, we'll um, support through the provision of public transport services. I don't think those are insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination, um, but they're things that we'd have to we'd have to work through, or the committee would have to work through, um, as to uh, how one would go about if a fixed envelope was provided, how that would be apportioned, or uh, if it were otherwise a case by case consideration, what parameters would be put around um, the allocation of that. Isn't it a case by case situation now with large scale community events? Uh, Is it first come, first serve? Well, at the moment, um, the They're only. They're all known. They are all known, and the, the ones. only ones that we work with directly are those that are very large, like um, yeah. like balloons, who uh, there, are, there are a very small number of events of that scale that are also free, effectively. Yeah, and. Um, Ballpark, what does it cost us to put buses on for um, something like the balloons? I don't have that number in front of me, I but I can check. Andy, Andrew may recall. Yes, it's um, uh, 50 to 60,000 per annum. The budget is uh, 50,000. For one event. Correct. Wow. <laughs> okay. But if. if um, because it's a massive opportunity, right? How many go to the, they reckon 70 odd thousand or something? Um, I don't know how many get on the bus. We should, we should mm -hmm. find out that. And that's a lot of people to experience a bus that probably, they won't be regular bus users, right? They're event users. And it's part of the day, it's part of the experience of the event. That's such a massive opportunity for us to get people on a bus that normally wouldn't, as well as it's reducing emissions. So. If, I mean, maybe this is, I just don't want us to close ourselves off to that. We had um, Peter Nation from Field Day saying, yes, they would financially contribute. So, and so I'm assuming the co current contract with H3 and uh, New Zealand Rugby is free, right? We put those buses on for free. Correct, yeah. yeah. Free for the user, yeah. And that, that contract would end at some point where they would have to then consider contributing. Um, it's not a it's not a formal contract, um, but it is an arrangement that has discontinued over time. And at the time of the operative policy being debated by councillors at the time, um, there was that clear expectation that existing arrangements would be grandparented through. Well, if it's not a formal, sorry, but if it's not, if I get really frustrated, we just seem to throw revenue away here. But if it's not a formal policy, then we could bring them into line with something for new large scale events. Well, Field Days is not new, it's been around forever, but the overarching, the overarching principle is to reduce emissions and find opportunities to get people onto buses. And events are such a great way to do that. So, um, really dissatisfied that we're giving H3, even though that's <laughs> my organisation free, you guys can have the free buses and other places that will contribute financially won't. So what what's the answer, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, as, as I say, look, I, I actually agree with the rationale um, you're, you're putting forward. So it is good rationale, in my opinion. Um, it just kept one of the outcomes we would probably want to avoid is if um, this budget issue is a, is a tricky one in the sense that we don't want to create a policy that builds an expectation that there is funding or yeah. something can happen when there's no funding. So it's a, um, I'm just turning my mind to how how so, so how do we manage those expectations? Yeah. 
and, and you know, to, I mean, I can't speak for my council, but actually um, it's good for our city network when there's a large scale event to have cars off the road as well. So possibly HCC should be contributing. But is it is it something that if it's signalled in a policy, <coughs> uh, could be part of some annual plan planning? Because I, I mean, I agree, if, if you set up a, a, a jam jar of money, that will either uh, not e not meet the expectations or people will just see it as a jam jar of money. So these large events know well in advance um, their planning. They could approach council under the policy. We would have time to talk to HCC and the event to come up with a to come up with a contract for one or two or three years for that event. Then we're able to budget in through our annual plans. But just opening the way for that for that to happen in the policy because our overarching goal is to reduce emissions. Does that yeah. sound like a way I've forward? got a few other people who want to weigh in on the yeah. discussion. Uh, Chair Barry. Uh, speaking in support of you, Angela, um, I think it's very important for this council to uh, recognise that significant events can cause quite significant traffic jams with greater emissions than you would normally have. Uh, and so we need to be able to measure which ones would qualify for that. And there's quite an easy formula to use. And that is that when an event gets to a certain size, it it is always has achieved a economic benefit and analysis has been done to show the economic value to the region. So you'll find that every major uh, rugby test held has an economic benefit of in excess of around about eight to 10 million. Um, you'll find that field days is up around the 300 million. Uh, so. Uh, and you'll even find that um, the balloons one is getting up around the test level or slightly higher. So it's about the <coughs> eight to 10 million sort of level. So um, it's easy enough to have a policy which recognises the value to a region. It's not just emissions, it's actually from tourism to economic development and so on. So. It, to my mind, it seems absolutely appropriate that the Regional Council has a policy that brings in emissions reduction, facilitating tourism, economic development, wrapped in, and we can talk about how we fund that, but essentially those are absolutely things that you can tick off that fit with the approach that you are looking at, as well as the broader issues that regional councils should be looking at. So I would say you should seek to push in that way, have a measure which stops the first in, first served approach and anybody can apply, that it has to have a certain threshold which is a proven threshold, and then you can apply that. It also ensure that you're dealing with those that create the greater emissions, because a smaller event has no really difference in terms of emission creation. So uh, that's what I'd be recommending, and I think it would. Uh, we should put that up as you say. There's instruments for creating funding, um, and I'd be going that that way down to pursue it. Thanks for that. Thanks for your <coughs> thoughts, Chair Barry. Um, I just had some thoughts around you know when people do large scale events, traffic management plans, and how does that trigger. Um, significant policies and to, you know, whether we step in with buses and so I'm, I don't have that experience from a district council point of view. So um, if we could, um, how that might work in as well. Mark's got some thoughts as well. Um, yeah, through, through the chair, um, I think um, this is something that's been pushed around the staff as well because we uh, I completely understand the point. Um, I think a suggested way forward here would be in respect of non-commercial free events to retain the policy as it is, um, 
possibly with the addition of, uh, and we'll work on the wording a little bit, but um, traffic management plan that adequately promotes mode shift. That's effectively what we're trying to achieve here. And then we could have a parallel policy that relates to um, that relates to commercial events. Um, the only reason for having a parallel policy is that because we are uncertain about the total demand that we would likely see for applications to this kind of thing, to have a policy that is specifically subject to a 12-month review, which would enable us to work through one, one year of applications, one year of process with the Connections Committee. If we have an oversubscription, we're not locking ourselves <coughs> into multiple years of oversubscription to a fund, or, um, or it would enable uh, the committee and then the regional council to form a view on assigning a specific budget that's, that's adequate. But I think with something like this where there's a high degree of uncertainty, um, uh, it would be beneficial to somehow um, effectively have the same policy but for commercial events to have a 12-month review so that we understand a little bit more about the volume and likely demand. Uh, through the chair, I, I would support that you, it also enables another option. Commercial events, because you're having a separate part of the policy, it could have a different a subsidy level from the free events. So you're bringing that opportunity in, so I fully support that. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, I, um, I should have added there um, that for the commercial events, um, the suggestion uh, that, that suggestion to have continuity with some of the pre-existing arrangements around the 30% contribution, um, but still subject to those same thresholding requirements in relation to the scale of the event and, um, and uh, adequacy in respect of a traffic management plan. Right. Does just, that fully satisfy it, Andrew? Yeah, and sorry, this might be too much technical detail. Um, the notion of the third or third or third um, is really quite unique to the rugby situation because there's three parties involved. Um, so, uh, you know, reference might be to 50% of um, service provision cost or something like that, but it sounds sounds like a very good approach. And, and just to be clear, there's no Waka Kotahi funding within that, is there? Um, we should be careful to word something in a way that doesn't preclude that but we shouldn't assume that it would be forthcoming. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to comment, Michelle? Or? I would um, agree with Andrew that we shouldn't assume that funding will be available, but... Um, but we won't preclude it either. That's right. <laughs> cool, thank you. All right, over to you, Andrew. Um, that's really it for the targeted services. Mark, are you happy just to recap what the what I understand, what we understand the, the intended changes to encompass? Uh, so one final comment on that before you do. <laughs> um, just a, uh, there's a really good section here in Community Transport, and I've had some great feedback on initiatives we've taken already in that area. Um, but I'm just wondering, um, like we've got P16, there's provide community support for transport services, and then there's A, B, and C, which all sound uh, really reasonable. But I just wonder why we'd need D. Um, you know, if, if there's a demonstrated need, there's a willingness of the group to set it up, and there's sufficient funding, why would you need, you know, as a condition or precondition, the, um, the support of the relevant Authority, territorial authority just seems like a, an added unnecessary step. Um, good point of discussion for this group and it may, I think it's probably a, a carryover from um, the previous or operative version of the plan um, and for context the assumption is that uh, we're moving to a regional rating model Yes. Uh, where this becomes maybe less relevant, um, but there yeah. still is a link to work really closely, and it's essential that we do with territorial authorities. Yeah, because the way it's worded, it almost sounds like a precondition. Um, 
provide support for services where A, B, C, D. Um, what if you had the first three in the council for some reason? Can't think of why, but said no. Well, we'd actually we don't support it. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't meet all the criteria. It just seems like an unnecessary extra step to me. Yeah, uh, through the chair, I'd suggest we do pick up on that point and tweak it to not be a read as a precondition, but still retain reference to working collaboratively uh, with, with with territorial authorities. OK, yep, happy to come come back to that one. Um, over to you, Mark, to sum up that little bit. Okay, through the chair. Um, the main changes in this area relate to a special. Uh, how, how far back am I going? Um, I will go all the way back to the regional accessibility, and I'll just cover those last those last three chunks that we went through. So, regional accessibility. We had the table, which has regional coverage within regional towns for the hours of operation in relation to the future aspirations for hours of operation to have a match between uh, with the same aspirational level in respect of between regional towns. Noting those are aspirational, those numbers are seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. In respect of special events um, or uh, all events um, to include uh, a criteria there around um, I just thought of the correct word as I was tapping it up, travel demand management plans. Um, retaining free coverage for special events as per the current policy. For commercial events, up to 50% of service provision costs and include a requirement that arrangements, that those arrangements for commercial events are subject to a review in 12 months. Um, for community transport, um, sorry, a little bit out of order there, but in respect of community transport, um, just to reword that uh, 16D so that the support of the TAs is not a precondition. Um, those are the changes that I have noted. Thanks, Mark. Um, Andrew, if we move on, thank you. Uh, apologies, I was on mute. Um, so objective three relates to fares and ticketing, so it outlines um, all our core policies uh, in respect to that. A lot of, we didn't get a huge amount of submissions on this point, in part because um, I, we've already implemented quite a bit. So for example, Super Gold card travel being free during all, all periods, um, we've amend, amended the plan to reference that, um, but, it, but it's implemented. As a general theme, um, submissions that did come through were requesting retention of half price fares for longer, um, which is a central government uh, initiative. So we would acknowledge that in our submission responses, and you know, we would certainly support that ourselves. The uh, or free travel, um, and then there was the specific request. Uh, relating to from GoBus, the bus operator, around removing cash fares from from buses in uh, in the interest of driver and passenger safety. Um, staff have suggested that we do include a policy that we would remove cash from buses when we implement the new national ticketing system and investigate options to do it earlier. And the nuance there is that with the new system, um, there should be a much better retail network off bus. That means it's less likely we'd, we'd significantly less likely we'd unintentionally preclude people from being able to travel on buses by removing that that cash fare option. Uh, and would certainly agree that if if we can do that without unintentionally affecting people, um, it would be good to do it earlier as well. So the, the policy and the action uh, enables uh, a pathway to potentially achieving that. Um, in essence, that's it relating to fears and ticketing. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, just picking up on a point that was raised at the last RCC meeting around there being more B card outlets. Um, so is that something that we would discuss 
at a future meeting when we look at removing cash earlier? Yeah, um, so yeah, any investigation to remove cash early, would, that would be a really key consideration. Okay, fantastic. And I just had one more thing around fair concessions, around the accessibility concession. It doesn't make note of the plus one on the disability. Uh, is that just point. an oversight? It, or? it is an oversight. It, it should make note of that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything from anyone else? Nope. Okay. It's a pretty easy one, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I need to repeat that, but we'll make sure we add the reference to the plus one policy for the accessibility concession. Cool, thank you. All right, next one, Andrew. Cool. So objective four is all about communication and marketing. Um, the So again, not a huge amount of submission feedback on this point, but some feedback from um, really important segments of the community, particularly the disabled um, sector. So there was uh, staff recommendations to include a new policy that confirms council will ensure effective communication options exist for people with disabilities. It's a given, but it's useful to have it explicitly stated. Another submission, um, that related submission included some really helpful expectations around what that means. So accessible formats, including New Zealand Sign Language, um, easy to read Braille, large print and audio. Um, we're not entirely sure what's, what, what level of effort is required to enable that via all our communication channels so that um, the intention here is to confirm the policy that we, you know, we're, we're going to make it work and then include a specific action to investigate and scope how we'll do it, which sets up um, the basis for, for doing it. Uh, and it's also this section that references bus back advertising. So a link to the conversation we had, we had earlier. Um, picking up on a point raised by Councillor O'Leary about, uh, I I think it was Councillor O'Leary or someone else. Um, this would, I'm not sure if it's this section, but related to the notion of disability, um, explicit policy about um, assistance animals on vehicles is, is a useful thing to be explicit about. I think it comes, it's more likely to be associated with objective a five or possibly the early one, um, but my suggestion is we should find a home for that. Sounds, sounds good. All right, um, nothing from around the table. Oh. No, if, it was, um, I did have somewhere in here where I thought that policy fit, fitted, but now I'm, I'm a bit lost. But so are we able to have, I suppose it is in communications, isn't it? Because it's about it's about being really bold with our PT services and that anyone with a disability with an assistant dog is 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 welcome. <coughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's more than just driver training. It has we have to be really public about that. And and this so it's, it was the assistance being welcoming for all assistance dogs onto the PT network and then that safe the space in the front or um, priority space for wheelchair users, people with disabilities and um, for their dogs. Because when we had a couple of submissions from the disability sector that said often just Joe Public will take up those spaces so it's about at the front of a bus, so it's about not making sure. I mean, if the bus is empty, people, I guess, they can sit there. But that that somehow, whether they're marked with the um, with the way the seating is or signage or whatever, that this priority seating is for people with disabilities. So yeah. is that is that something we need to do in the policy? It's a um, my suggestion. Yeah. Absolutely, we should be really clear and overt around assistance animals are welcome on on public transport, um, but that being distinct from pets generally. Um, with respect to uh, markings and priority seating areas, 
um, that forms a requirement of the requirement for urban buses, which is a national standard set by Waka Kotahi. Um, all our vehicles are what we call RUB compliant, um, except for um, some of our on-demand vehicles, which we're trialling. Um, but the, we, in our on-demand fleet, which consists of four vehicles at the moment, we have um, wheelchair accessible RUB compliant vehicles, and we have two for transit vans, but the the logic there is the, the booking system is capable of ensuring that the wheelchair accessible vehicle is dispatched to people that, that have that need, so um, that they shouldn't get a, a vehicle that doesn't meet their needs being dispatched to them, so it's something that's been trialling yeah, uh, yeah, trial at the, the moment. Uh, the, su the submission and, and the experience, the lived experiences from that, um, particularly that one submitter that had you know, emails and emails of, um, was it Chris Ford and Tim Young from DPA? I can't remember. No, no, it was the, it was it the was chat the with man. the doggy. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, it's heart heartbreaking Roger, stuff. Roger, Drow Roger Drower, yeah. So I just, um, yeah, wonder, somewhere in here, if, if we have a, so that when anyone from the disability sector or anyone using this plan, looks at it, they understand that actually um, these, you know, these these kinds of services on our PT network are not an afterthought that yeah. they are planned for. And I note, um, remember I sent around that cute video of London Transport with the, and how uh, their education campaign really welcomes assistance dogs on the, on the private, that was private PT network as well as public. But Auckland Transport goes, uh, a step further and actually says if there's a complaint that comes through, um, whether it's a driver, or I'm assuming actually it's, if it's a complaint from a driver, that that complaint will be fully investigated and there are consequences. So I think we just need to strengthen um, strengthen our policy for disability users and, and that that's loud enough for the public to understand in some form of educating as well. Uh, one hundred percent. People aren't an afterthought on a bus, you know. They're yeah. planned, and this is this is the level of service that we're giving them. Yeah, I one hundred percent agree. So I think the um, the the notion is really yeah. clear. We'll mark up track change versions to go through to um, RCC, uh -huh. achieving exactly what you're talking about. And whichever objective it sits. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Uh, Eugene. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just, just following on from that, and not just so it's it's in this document, but after the hearings the other day, have Andrew, have we discussed with our contractors about not allow, you know, making sure this sort of stuff doesn't happen again? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll follow up with the ops team, but um, absolutely, like any, and I, and I know being the PT manager during that time period, any complaint or issue we got uh, relating to that was immediately followed up uh, with the bus operator and, and, and investigated thoroughly. Um, having CCTV on all our vehicles really helps uh, yeah. determine what's happened and why. But yes, it's something the team I know take very seriously. The thought of someone um, disabled being left on the side of the road is, is not something anyone is comfortable with. That, that and and not allowing dogs, you know, service dogs on there is is actually was quite um, quite a shame that, that that was happening. So just as long as it goes down the you know goes through the channels that the the drivers etc are well aware of of so much the rules, but the, you know the regulations around allowing that to happen because it's all very well us sitting in here creating these these plans, but if they're not the at the end, if those people are not knowledgeable of what the rules are, um, doesn't matter what you put on here, it doesn't work. So we need yes, to make sure I, that that's done. I agree and point, point, point noted, yes. Uh, Chair Barry. Um, yeah, capturing that those remarks and others, I think it's very important that council indicates, um, uh, let's say, a, a prescription of um, um, respectful use of public transport. And I don't just talk about picking up, 
you know, uh, targeting particular groups. I'm talking about generally people going on to buses, how they are expected to behave. And, and the reason why I want something put forward in a document is that uh, when you establish a certain standard of behaviours, and that means respecting certain groups and any others, it creates a baseline for you to make further steps that are based on and validated by that original statement. So I, I think it would be very useful and I think people would welcome it that there's a standard of behaviour expected on a bus, but do we ever put that out there as to what that standard of behaviour is? And I, I think that's that would be a very useful and it would probably gain quite substantial public support. So uh, I would suggest that you look at something like that um, and it would help. It would also help for trespassing later on. You can say you've breached that code, we're going to trespass a person or persons or whatever. So um, I would suggest you look at that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, I know that through Tahuia we have looked at some sort of etiquette on, on Tahuia and, and specifics, but broadening that to um, PT in general would be good. Yeah, um, through the chair, we do actually have, um, and it is posted within the Transport Centre, and I can't recall whether or not it's physically posted in summary form on the vehicles themselves, but there is a passenger code of conduct. Um, or that applies to passengers. It's available on the website um, as well. Um, but it may be fair to say that, um, and it's quite it's quite short. Um, I I can't recall off the top of my head whether that's visible to passengers inside the vehicles. But there is a passenger code. Mark, I can confirm it was. They, that it was visible on every bus, um, but we probably need to double check that the posters have been reinstated. They got. Um, yeah. Competition for space with COVID posters. Through, through the chair, I'm, I'm anticipating it should go further than just that sort of one liner. It should be about how the bus driver will interact, how you interact with the bus driver or the driver, or, you know, it's, it's about those relationships and spelling that out because, you know, one line to me, you know, putting that up doesn't cut it. You know, I, I think the public are really screaming for uh, improved standards where they're sharing spaces uh, with others. A and so we've got to be a bit more nuanced in how we respond to that and, uh, you know, start putting that up more front of mind because I, I think that's a pressing issue today about behaviours and what we expect when you're using something. So it's... It's a bit more uh, going a bit further than what we've been done. Great suggestions. Um, Bea, fully support what's been discussed. Um, Councillor Larry. Yeah, I just want to support um, Barry on that as a concept because a lot of the submissions mentioned, I feel unsafe, whether it's at a bus stop or on a bus. Um, the bus driver was rude to me. So it's, it's an opportunity for a, a significant I think, significant education campaign, but also, you know, clearly through submissions, it is it is a barrier to using PT. So it's something that we probably, we, we should be addressing more than just a, a sign of, you know, about, and I'm assuming actually that if drivers have a bad, ex, <coughs> bad passenger that they can stop the bus or if they being threatened or something, you stop the bus and let the person off. But if the wider, if if, an, if we have a campaign where that's educating at the wider public that this is the standard and it's and it's some clever messaging and uh, then you get a bit more um, buy-in. I think it should there should be a, a standard of behaviour set and. I think it's a really great opportunity. And one of the other things you can cross off my list then was in response to that was about we, we talk about PT networks being efficient and all of these other things, but we don't talk about them being being fun and enjoyable, an enjoyable experience. And that possibly that that is a 
a barrier for people with behaviour at the moment. Of course, we saw it when we did the school kids, didn't we, at the transport centre and on buses, their behaviour was atrocious and intimidating for public. So um, maybe that comes under the, the comms one that we just did, communication and education, but I think it's important to actually, yeah, put a, a line somewhere or a policy somewhere that that's something that we need to address and tackle because it's a great idea. Yeah, fully support all of that. Um, and yeah, for it to include transport centre and all bus stops, yeah, definitely. All right, um, is there anything more on objective four? Okay, um, do we need to discuss the bus back Percentage? Eighty, twenty, or eighty percent. As long as we're getting our eighty percent. <laughs> yeah. um, Mark, just just in the process, do we need to resolve that now, or was that a discussion for a further time? My my suggestion would be to. Um, uh, my suggestion would be to, for the time being, to retain the policy at 80%. Um, I'm conscious that um, there'll be another significant opportunity to have a look at this in the area where bus back advertising will make the most difference in the Unit 1 and 2 contracts, um, following actually the next revision of the PT, well, within this cycle of the PT plan, so it's certainly something that we can take as an action to report back to the Connect Committee. That if, um, in terms of the exactly the kind of information that you're seeking, I'm just not sure that we'll be able to get you sufficiently robust information to form a view on whether 2010 or otherwise yeah. is a good number. But we certainly will be able to take that away and get it to you by the time we're looking at um, re-letting contracts for that urban, those major urban ones. But importantly, we have we've changed that amendment to the revenue. A, we'll collect it. Mm. And we need assurances that it's going to be collected. And and the second thing that it was to go to the pilot programs person catching. <coughs> We've done that bit, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I won't die in the ditch over the 80, 20, 90, 10. Okay, that sounds fair. Um, just in regards to is that gonna be an annual thing that we look at those pilot programs, or is that just whenever? Annual. Okay, well, that sounds fair. I'm sure we'll make ways to spend it. Um, Mark, so that was that objective four covered? Yes, through, through you, Mary. Um, Chair, I have uh, a couple of notes there. They relate to um, that uh, communications, including the nature of facilities and provision for people with disabilities, priority seating, accessible vehicles, et cetera, um, carriage of um, assistance dogs is, uh, is reflected in uh, um, that we also have uh, that component there which reflects the discussion that we had earlier um, and was just recapped on in relation to the retention of bus back advertising to fund annual pilot programs to reduce transport emissions by increasing patronage and contributing to mode shift rather than offsetting. Um, through the chair, I think there was just one more minor point um, that came up earlier about formally acknowledging the PT plan reserving 10% of bus backs for uh, the public purpose type advertising. Yeah, that's right. 
um, as long as that's been <laughs> noted. That is fine. Um, okay, lunch is ready. Um, I propose we take lunch break now and come back at 1 p.m. Um, to finish off. So yeah, we'll adjourn the meeting.